Good morning, international family. J.P. Greer here from the Sentinels for Christ for your Friday installment of SFC 15 in the Word. And I just want to bless you as you go into your weekend. We've had a great week here at Sentinels for Christ. You know, a lot of what we do in our faith, it involves seeking God. It involves trying to understand Him better. And one of the ways we do that is through reading His Word. But do you know another way that we do it is just by reaching out in faith and accessing people and reaching out to people in the name of Jesus. That's going to be part of the scripture text today. But this week we had an incredible opportunity to bless our local community, um, conduct a prayer event where we prayed for the people, the institutions, the schools, everything in the community together. So it's good in Jesus' name. And my hope is that as you go into the weekend that you're blessed by today's uh, scripture reading from the chapter of Matthew. So we will jump right into it and then spend a few minutes on the other side of it uh, commenting. And as we do at Sentinels for Christ, trying to take out the elements that generally cause confusion and to make things simpler. Okay, so with that, Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. This is a continuation, by the way, of the previous chapter, Matthew 24, when Jesus was having a specific discussion with his disciples about the end of the world and about his return, okay? So he's continuing to talk to them out about the issue specifically regarding the kingdom of God and his return. It's important we understand that, okay? So this is one discussion. Then the kingdom of God, or Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, will be comparable to ten virgins. They took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish and five of them were smart. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no extra oil with them. But the smart ones took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and they began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of those virgins rose and prepared their lamps. The foolish one said to the smart ones, Give us some of your oil so that our lamps do not go out. But the smart one said, No, there will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up the door for us. But he said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on your alert then, for you don't know what day or what the hour is. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. Jesus is continuing to talk about the kingdom of God, and now he's talking about the hour, okay? For the man on the journey, he called his own slaves to him, and he entrusted his possessions to them. And to one, he gave five talents of gold, to another, one talent, and to another, two. Each one was given gold in accordance to his own ability. And then the man went on his journey. Now immediately, the one who had received the five talents of gold traded with them, and he was able to gain five more talents of gold. In the same manner, the one who had been given the two talents gained two more talents. But he who had received the one talent went away. He dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and he settled accounts with these people. The one who received the five talents came up and brought the five more talents saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter now into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, 
I've gained two more talents with that that you gave me. His master said to him, well and done, good and faithful slave. You've been entrusted with a few things, and now I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Same response. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you don't scatter any seed. And I was afraid. And I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, I'm giving you back what's yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew about me that I reap where I don't sow and I gather where I don't get scatter seed. You should have put my money in the bank and then on my arrival, I would have at least received interest on what was deposited. Therefore, take away the talent from this man and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out that worthless slave into the outer darkness, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus continues, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as the sheep separates uh, the shepherd from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared before you from the beginning of the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And then the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. And I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Chapter 25. Let's have a couple minutes of commentary. As I mentioned, it's important to remember that this is a continuing discussion to disciples. So Jesus is now, after he talks about the return and what to watch for when he returns to heaven and earth, he moves into this whole discussion, really, of accountability, okay, and also aspects of judgment. And we can't miss that, all right? Remember, he's talking to disciples. So there's an accountability here that is specifically applicable to those who say they're going to follow Christ, to those who say that I'm a disciple. So what Jesus has to say here is fair game for people who say I'm a follower of Jesus. Um, this is not something particularly that I would say is, is a judgment standard for those who don't know Jesus. One of the most important things we can do when we read the Bible is understand the audience who Jesus is talking to. So there's three elements here, three large parables that are discussed in Matthew 25 that we want to shed some light on in a way that blesses you. The first is the parable of the ten virgins, okay? The second uh, uh, is the parable of the landowner who goes away, and the third uh, is, is the parable of the sheep and the goats, okay? All of these are actually sequentially related to one another, and while you can read the Word of God and take one of these parables and get spiritual truth principles out of the parable, 
because a parable has spiritual truth principles within it, the greater picture is to understand these parables and what Jesus is saying in this one dialogue, which because it is a roadmap or it is a compass for a disciple of Jesus who decides to go on the journey of following Jesus and what it looks like. And the first element is the parable of the ten virgins. And I'm not going to get down deeply into some of the more uh, specific details in those as much as I want to stay general. Okay, The parable of the ten virgins is a continuation of what Jesus uh, stop talking about Matthew chapter 24, which he ended Matthew chapter 24 pretty much saying, no one knows the hour except the Father, not even the Son. What was the hour Jesus was talking about? What's well, the same hour that he's talking about at the beginning of Matthew 25, 25, his return, okay? And we have this parable of the 10 virgins who are supposed to be ready for an advent, in this case, a wedding that was happening at that time. So the focus on the parable of the ten virgins is be ready, be accountable, okay? Because you don't know the hour. This is something that Jesus leaned into a lot. Instead of focusing on, on, on the micro details of legalism and either doing something that's right or doing something that's not right to say that we're in, uh, we're saved, we're going to heaven. He always wiped that slate clean and focused on the issue of being in right relationship with the Father, okay? So the 10 virgins need to be in right relationship because it's only people who are in right relationship who will maintain themselves being ready for his coming, okay? It's not about having all the, the T's crossed or all the I's dotted or having all the right prayers said or the right amount of devotional time done or going to the right church. It's about being ready. The second parable, the parable of the talents, is a parable of those who are right are accountable with what they have been given. You see, the people who have been given talents are representative of those who say that they follow Jesus. So there's a couple things that we want to take away so that we want to pull out that confusion, okay? The landowner who is representative of Jesus and the Father in this parable gives to his servants people who say that they're following Jesus, okay? Things to do, resources that are in accordance with their abilities, okay? You can't miss it. That's why one servant gets five talents, one servant gets two, one servant gets one. The parable is not about God picking on the person who has one servant. Jesus completely refuted that principle repeatedly in the Gospels by saying to his disciples and to his religious rulers of the time that quite often the first will be last and the last will be first. So this is not a parable about um, five talents, two talents, and one talent. It's about being accountable for what God has given you, okay? The grace that comes from this is that the master goes away for a long time, okay? There's plenty of time for these um, slaves or followers of him to take the resources that he gave him and do something good with it, okay? And the man with five does it, the man with two does it, but there's one that doesn't do anything with what he's got, and that's the focal point of this parable, is that there's an accountability, because that parable ends on the issue of accountability. How do we know that? Because as Jesus drills down and focuses on that parable, the thing he has to say to the man who did nothing with what he was given, and that's the point of the parable. What are you doing? What am I doing if we say we follow Jesus with what we have been given? We have a saying in Sentinels for Christ, and that saying is, you got to get out of the boat. You know, quite often sometimes in my faith, when I'm moving forward or I'm listening to God and trying to figure out what's the next steps of, of what does he want me to do practically with people? Um, he wants me to make disciples. He says that at the end of Matthew in chapter 28. But how I go about doing that, the practical way of doing it, I have to listen to God. Often he doesn't give really particular clear instructions as much as he just says go. The final parable is going to tell us what those clear instructions are really and what the framework is for what those instructions should look like, okay? The end of the parable of the landowner and the slaves, the emphasis point is be accountable with what you've gotten because the man who does nothing with what he's given, this man is a deceived man who's saying that he's following this master, does nothing with it. And when Jesus says, throw that man, throw that servant out in a place where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, 
When Jesus says that, he's talking to someone being cast or removed from God's presence after this life into the next life. And that place is what the Bible teaches is called hell. It's separation from God eternally, okay? There's no way that you can miss that. Sometimes I wish it, it, that wasn't the case. Frankly, I do. But Jesus doesn't pull any punches there. So when he says that someone is to be put in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's what he means when he's talking about this. Boom. How do we know that? Because of the way the next parable ends. All of these parables end with people who weren't ready, weren't accountable, or did not do something that they knew that was right, that Jesus holds them accountable for. And as a result of that in the next life, they are not with God reconciled in Christ. Okay. Whoa. That's huge. It's serious, but sometimes the Bible hits us right between the eyes because Jesus wants to shake us up. Why does he want to do that? Because following him and where we spend our ourselves eternally, okay, after this life is an issue of choice in response to God's offer to walk with him or not. And you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus stands at the door and knocks in Revelation 3.20. It's a beautiful metaphor, a beautiful parable that says that he knocks but if someone knocks at the door, you and I have to open it, okay? You've got to remember this invitational aspect um, that is behind all these parables. Parable number three, the sheep and the goats. Often this is used to focus on um, the issue of, of judgment of the world at the end. And there is a component, absolutely, uh, because when Jesus is talking about um, the son sitting on his throne, that's not metaphorical, that's not symbolic. This comes from the 22nd chapter of Revelation when there will be a throne, the great white throne, and the world will stand before the Son of God, okay? But the, the sheep and the goats are a metaphorical part of what will take place in front of that throne. And notice what the litmus test, notice what the deciding factor is, notice what Jesus says is most important. At Sentinels for Christ, we have another saying, okay, you've heard one of them. The second one is this, if it's not relational, it's not from Jesus, okay? It doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter what I share with you, okay? That sounds good, that sounds Christian. It doesn't matter even what money I give to the church. If I am not walking through this world in relationship with others, okay? Compassionate to other people, because Jesus living inside of me after becoming a Christian has changed the way I look at people, has changed the way I see people, has built faith in me so that I interact with them in a completely different way. If that has not happened and does not become part of my life, I am most likely not in the kingdom of God, okay? Or we would say in Christianity, not saved, or possibly at the very beginning of our um, salvation experience. We just haven't grown enough to get that yet. The emphasis, okay, on the parable in front of the white throne and the sheep and the goats is people. It's people, okay? This is why Jesus says that those that will be with him are those that reach out to those who are sick, hungry, in prison. They don't have clothes. It's the practical aspects of ministering to people in this world. One of the I think the ultimate things that tells me whether or not a person has an authentic faith where Jesus is really at the center of their heart is how they interact with people. Because I got to tell you, in Christianity, I think one of the things that, that we've blown it with, and when I say we, I'm talking about leaders in the church. One of the things that I think that, that we've done the worst is we've lost this aspect of people because we tend to default around structure, okay? And, and, and build structures and build belief systems around structures. I'm not saying those things aren't true, okay, or, or important. I'm just saying they're not the priority, and that's what the end of Matthew 25 is saying. It's people. It's better, okay, to have a ministry or a church without a building and focus on people than it is to have a church structure that has a beautiful building and there is no focus on people. There's just a bunch of good Christian talk where people come on Sunday and they leave and their lives are not transformed. Jesus says in this parable, the fruit, the litmus test, the deed that says not guilty in front of the throne is how we interact with people when we are saying we are one of his disciples, okay? When we are seeing one of his disciples, it should change everything about how we interact. God is so gracious, my friend, that I want to bless you because these are heavy teachings that Jesus gives today. You don't have to be perfect. 
Because if, you, if Jesus has come into your life, you will understand that his gracious reach out to you and offer of forgiveness is so kind and so loving that it should transform your heart so that you're like that to others, okay? It's that simple. So how you react to others in an aspect of love, that's what Jesus is emphasizing. Now, there are some accountability points that we build our faith around, okay? But if we're not doing it in love amongst each other, amongst other Christians for sure, okay? But also amongst the world, then we have every right to ask ourselves whether or not we are really in the faith. Ouch. Yep, I said that live. Or whether or not we've really grown in our relationship with Christ. So as you go into this weekend, I want you to bless you and remember the grace of God. Okay? The grace of God and the litmus test of Matthew 25 is be ready, be accountable, and be doing the job that Jesus says we're supposed to do. It's just like a job here on earth, okay? You do the job. There's so many things in the kingdom of God that are the same as this earth that God set up, which was made to lead us to him. Beloved, for this weekend, may God bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And until we meet each other again on Monday in Matthew 26, we are at the end of Jesus' life. He's in Jerusalem. We're heading towards the cross. Have a good weekend in Jesus' name. J.P. Greer here from Sentinels for Christ, 15 in the Word.